Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to talk about logistic regression. Together with linear regression, logistic regression completes the necessary foundation for predictive modeling. After understanding this, you'll be able to solve both types of problems. When you've given a value prediction problem, you'll be able to apply linear regression. When you're given a classification problem, you'll be able to apply logistic regression. Let's understand the difference. So we have seen this kind of data so far. Let's say given a variable like area of the property, we are predicting the price of the house. But what if the data was a little different? For example, let's say you were trying to help a bank figure out who are the customers who would like to go for a long-term deposit. We are trying to decide that based on the credit score of the customers. So we have the credit score, but the prediction that we are making is no longer a value like the house price. It's a class. So zero represents the people who would potentially not go for a term deposit. And one represents the people who aren't the ideal targets for term deposit. They have excess money, which they can deposit and earn a secured interest on that. Now, this is a different kind of problem. And if we understand this visually, this is what it means. When we were taking one variable, like the area of the property and predicting the house price, it was a typical regression problem, a linear regression problem. So what this line does in this case is that it tries to best represent these points. All these points are combinations of the area of the property and the house price. We are trying to approximate these points through this line. Now, what changes with respect to the decision when we are solving the classification problem? It becomes something like this. We are saying we have values between zero and one. In fact, we only have zeros and ones. So these are, let's say, zeros and these are ones. And if we say that we want to solve this problem using a line, we would probably end up drawing a line like this. We'll say points above this line are not to be made the offer or not to be targeted. And the point below this line are to be targeted. With an exception of these points where we seem to be making errors. Because if we generalize with the help of this line, we would not make offers to these people. But in reality, we know that these people actually went for a term deposit. Similarly, since these points are below the line, we would have considered them for targeting. But that will again be a mistake because these people actually did not go for a term deposit. See, in supervised learning, the ground truth or the fact is already reported to us. And using that fact and the historical data, we are trying to come up with a model. Notice that y-axis in this case represents a probability because you are not predicting a value. You're predicting whether a given observation is likely to be a subscriber or a non-subscriber. So obviously, we would not be able to do good with the help of this line. Notice in this case, we are using a line not to represent these points but to segregate these points. And line may not be a bad choice as a segregator, but there are a couple of fundamental problems with the line. Let's understand those. So we've seen equation of simple linear regression and multiple linear regression. The only change is that in case of multiple linear regression, we add more variables and more coefficients. But there are two main issues if we are using a line to predict the probability. What are those? Number one, probability always lies between zero and one. So if you see in this case, this line may not necessarily be restricted to zero and one only. A line can extend from negative infinity to positive infinity in terms of y value. How are we going to ensure that this is always between zero and one? You might say that we'll probably do some kind of a capping at zero and one and say that you know, if it's below zero, we'll bring it to zero. If it's above one, then we'll bring it to one. So you can put some restrictions on that. Then comes the second problem. And the second problem is bigger. The probabilities don't vary linearly. What does it mean? Let's understand this with the help of an example. So let's say we are talking about achieving 10% score improvement in the exams. Now, event A is when your current score is 55% and event B is when your current score is 85%. A is represented by the probability P1 and event B is represented by the probability P2. Without much deliberation, you'll be able to think that most likely P1 will be greater than P2. Why? Because if you're at 55% score, there is a larger room for improvement. Achieving another 10% improvement is going to be easier. You're talking about the same exam. Whereas a person sitting at 85 hardly has any room because your score can't be above 100%. So this person might have already tried his best to be able to achieve 85%. Any further improvement would require a lot more effort, a lot more command on the subject. Whereas for this person, the hopes could be high because in the same exam, somebody is already achieving 85%. Whereas this person is at 55. So there's a high chance that this person can improve. Again, we are talking in terms of probability, but the idea was that probabilities don't vary linearly. So how justified would it be to make decisions related to probabilities based on a line? Which means we actually need a link function, a kind of function which is not a line, and it is always confined between zero and one. 
And the answer to this comes in the form of the sigmoid function. So in calculus, if you've studied different functions, you would know that sigmoid function is a function which always lies between zero and one, no matter what the value of x is. And it is, of course, nonlinear. How would it act as a classifier for us? Let's understand that. So imagine this is the kind of decision that we have to make, right? So we have these points, which are the people not to be targeted. And we have these points, which are the people to be targeted. We are able to draw this kind of a curve, which doesn't vary linearly. Notice that you might still say that this curve also seems to be making errors, which is fine, but at least it is not violating the fundamental assumption. It is still operating in the range of zero to one, which is very much like probabilities, and it is nonlinear. Now, can we fine tune this curve to ensure that we reduce the error? Let us understand in terms of expressions or equations, how does logistic regression look like? So in case of linear regression, we know in simple one variable scenario, we had this equation. Y hat is equal to beta naught plus beta one X. In case of logistic regression, we are predicting probabilities and we are using a sigmoid function. So the equation is like this. Probability is equal to one over one plus E, which is a constant raised to the power negative Y hat, where this Y hat is still equal to beta naught plus beta one X. So let's understand what will be the influence of beta naught and beta one on the probability. All right, so here we are, we have the same sigmoid function and we have the coefficient values which we can adjust, right? So let's just see if we take this coefficient two, which is in this case, beta naught, if we take this to a little lower value, what would happen? You see the shape of the sigmoid is kind of changing. And if this is how the shape of the sigmoid is, what would it mean to our classification problem? Can you imagine we are looking at a scenario like this? So earlier, these two points were misclassified. But now these two points are being properly classified because they are being covered as the sigmoid function on one side. Likewise, if we increase the value of this coefficient two, then what happens? Let's say we bring it to this extreme. Then what happens? Do you see the shape of the sigmoid function is kind of changing? Still a basic S-shaped curve, but you can see it is changing. And now what does it mean to our classification problem? It is something like this. So this point, which was earlier being misclassified, would be classified properly. Notice, we still would have some errors. For example, this remains an error, and these two points also remain errors. But changing the values of the coefficients would make a difference to the sigmoid function, and we'll accordingly be able to tune our model. This is what we did in case of a line. We could draw multiple lines, but we settled for the line with the least error. And how did the line change? The line changed by adjusting its coefficient. Here, the sigmoid is changing by adjusting the coefficients. So I've only changed the values of constant, which is beta naught, so we adjust the coefficient somewhere in between and also try to change the values of the coefficient beta one. And let's see what happens. So you see, sigmoid entirely changed. If I move it here, then what happens? So this is a nice visual representation. How does a sigmoid curve get affected when you change the coefficient values? Hope you get the idea. You may be wondering, in case of linear regression, we had a simple linear regression which had just one independent variable. We've seen one independent variable and how does it affect the logistic regression. But in regression, we also studied multiple linear regression, which means when you had more than one independent variable, how does it affect the outcome? What it would be like in case of a logistic regression. So this is another visual representation. Let's say we have taken another variable to explain the outcome. Instead of just one variable x, we have a variable x1 and a variable x2. These two variables are trying to explain an outcome. Now, instead of just one coefficient, we will now have three coefficients. There is coefficient one for x1, there is coefficient two for x2, and then there is a constant term. And there are some default values. But why I brought you here is because I wanted to show you how does it appear in a multi-dimensional space. So you can imagine this is like a paper, which is kind of a little rolled paper, which you're trying to open. So it is again forming an S kind of a shape. And in the multidimensional space, it's called a hyperplane, right? We can try to change the values of the coefficients and the constants and see how does it affect the outcome. Let's say I, I'm trying to change one of the variables. Do you see its shape is further changing? The paper is kind of rotating. And let's say we try to change this variable as well. Then what happens? It's going in the other direction. So if I reduce this further, what would happen? You can see this is how it's, it's clearly looking like an S shape. If you look at it from one side, let's say from this direction X2, Sideways, it will exactly look like a sigmoid function to you, right? So I hope you get a better idea that what we saw in a 2D would be translated into 3D. Unfortunately, we will not be able to demonstrate more than three dimensions typically through this kind of visualization. So we limit it, but hope you get a clear understanding that 
what a sigmoid is like, and how is it interacting. What are these axes? This is our first independent variable. This is our second independent variable. And this is the probability that we are predicting in a range of zero to one. So no matter what, stays between zero and one and can accept values for the independent variables. These were just some dummy values that we started with on a scale of negative 10 to 10, just to visually demonstrate it. Now we understand that changing the values of beta one, beta two, beta naught affects the sigmoid function. But how do we settle for the right values for these coefficients? That's what we're going to understand next. For our example right now, let's just consider only six points. Let's say we have these three points and these three points. These three points here represent the event where we don't want to target the prospects. And these three points represent the event when we want to target the prospect. We want to pitch the term deposit to these people and we don't want to pitch the term deposit to these people. So what should be the case? How should the probabilities be looked at? One is, this is an ideal case where this probability is almost close to zero. When the probability is almost close to zero, you're saying that you're not going to target this prospect. You're not going to pitch. This case is also very clear when you're saying the probability is almost close to one, which means you're definitely going to pitch the term deposit to this. But these points here are somewhere in between. And in fact, misclassification. In fact, that's the very reason that we kept these here as examples. What is the probability corresponding to this point? Almost zero. What is the probability corresponding to this point? Almost one. What about the probability of this point, this point, this point, and this point? This will be obtained by taking the corresponding value on this sigmoid curve. So if I were to show you a little clearly, P1 is almost zero, P6 is almost one, but all the other probabilities for this second point, probability is this point on the curve. For this point, this is P4. For this point, it is P3. For this point, it is P5. These are the corresponding values on the sigmoid curve. Note that we want P1, P2 and P3, the probabilities corresponding to these red points to be as small as possible. And we want the probabilities corresponding to these blue points, these are P4, P5 and P6, to be as high as possible. When I say as high, the max is one, to as close to one as possible. There is a slight conflict. For some points, we want the probabilities to be minimized. For some points, we want the probabilities to be maximized. What if we are able to write this in such a way that for all the points, the probabilities are to be maximized. Can we do that? Actually, there is a way out and it's like this. Instead of writing as P1, if we write one minus P1. So if we say one minus P1 is to be maximized, that implies P1 is to be minimized. Similarly, if we say one minus P2 is to be maximized, P2 will be minimized. As such, P4, P5 and P6, we don't have a problem with. We always wanted them to be maximized because we wanted them to be close to one. And again, for P3, if P3 is to be minimized, then one minus P3 is to be maximized. So we have written all these probabilities in the terms where we are talking about them in one direction and their maximization. So remember, any machine learning problem would always be solved keeping an objective in mind. In case of linear regression, we had this objective. The squared differences between the actual and predicted values added up is something that we wanted to be minimized sum of a squared error. What is this objective in case of logistic regression? In case of logistic regression, this is the objective. The same thing that we just discussed. The so one minus P1, one minus P2, one minus P3, multiplied by P4, P5, and P6. All these asterisks represent products. So all these products taken up should be maximized. We are looking for such values of coefficients which give us the maximized output for this equation. Now imagine we've just taken six points it could be multiple points, but the fundamentals stay the same. This is known as the maximum likelihood. You might have heard about this term if you've dealt with statistics. Now, one word of caution, maximum likelihood is not the same as probabilities. In terms of common interaction in English, we use probability and likelihood interchangeably. But likelihood is ideally a term you want to use when you're trying to estimate something using probabilities. So we are using the probabilities here and we are trying to estimate what, not the probabilities, but the coefficients. That's where likelihood plays a role. All right, so with this so far, we've already covered that sigmoid is the solution because it stays between zero and one. It is nonlinear. And we also learned about the objective. Let's understand a little bit about the kind of expressions involved in case of logistic regression. So we've already seen these expressions. This is a simple linear regression. This is the equation to derive the probabilities using the sigmoid function. Y hat here is the same as beta naught plus beta one X. If this is the equation that we have, can we do slight changes? And we are aware of how to get the probability using Y hat. 
But is there a way that we can get to know how we can get Y hat using probabilities? What I mean to say is this. Can we do some manipulations to this expression? Let's say we do 1 minus P. If you try to do this on your own, you will realize that the right-hand side of this expression then would be this. And what if we divide the first expression by the second expression? We divide this by this. What we're going to get is something like this. You may try that on your own. If you do this, the denominators would get cancelled. You will have 1 over e raised to the power negative y hat. And that can easily be written as e to the power y hat. Now we're just one step away in getting y hat in terms of probability. So we'll have to take the log to the base e on both the sides. And what we get is this. The y hat is log of p over 1 minus p. By the way, what is this p over 1 minus p? This p is the probability of occurrence of the event that we are interested in. In our example, this was the event of a prospect agreeing for a term deposit. And 1 minus p in that case would be the prospect not agreeing for a term deposit. This is a case where we should have targeted because the prospect is likely to agree. This is the case where we should have not targeted the prospect because prospect is less likely to agree. And this is called the log odds ratio. So what is this y hat? Once again, using this expression, we can say this is beta naught plus beta 1x. So in case of logistic regression, you don't have a linear relationship between y hat and x. That was the case with linear regression. In case of logistic regression, you have a linear relationship between the log odds ratio and x. This is actually one of the assumptions for logistic regression. And what would happen if we have one more variable? Instead of just x, let's say we have x1 and x2 here. So if that's the case, then you will expand your expression. Instead of just writing beta 1x, you will write beta 1x1 plus beta 2x2. And similarly, for the log odds ratio, you will write beta 1x1 plus beta 2x2. So that's about the basic expressions. Let's quickly understand the assumptions involved in logistic regression. Some of these are common, as we saw in linear regression. So the first one is, we've just now discussed that there has to be a linear relationship between the independent variables and log odds ratio, log p over 1 minus p. This is a common assumption of multicollinearity that we had with linear regression as well, that we do not want independent variables to be relative. So when you have more than one variable involved, let's say x1, x2, x3, you do not want those variables to be correlated to each other. We also discussed something called as homoscedasticity, which was about the constant variance of the error terms. That stays the same. Notice that logistic regression does not have any assumption about the normal distribution of the errors, but it still has the assumption on the homoscedasticity. And lastly, we need sufficiently large samples, even for the minor class labels. So remember, in case of logistic regression, we have a classification target, zeros and ones. So one of them could be more in our data. Maybe we will have very few people subscribing to the term deposit and very high number of people not subscribing. So even for the class which is relatively less occurring in our data, we should have enough observations. Only then a model would be able to learn. So these are the assumptions associated with logistic.